Assalamu alaikum, you're watching Views and News and I'm Faisal Rahman live from our Islamabad uh, studios. Today we'll be talking about uh, the ongoing deadly protests in and outside New Delhi where the Sikh farmers are still protesting since it is a problem related to the uh, political economy uh, primarily and the corporate culture has such an influence out there that basically the Prime Minister is under that kind of an influence so he is supporting the uh, corporate uh, world out there. At the same time, you know, when you talk about the protests that have been going on for months and the kind of commitment that has been shown uh, by the Sikh farmers, that's unbelievable. They say that they can stay there for another one year. They've got enough food and enough will to, in fact, uh, carry on their protest. Now, interestingly, uh, the clashes they have started since it was 26th of January yesterday, the Indian Republic Day where I, in fact, uh, very interestingly told you last night also that the uh, parade uh, was on and they were showing the tanks and the missiles and the mighty military arsenal of the Indian forces, whereas the poor farmers were still asking for their rights. And the way the police went after them and the clashes, I mean, you can see that on your visual screens also. The police is running away now. That is what is happening because the will of the farmer, that's too high. At the same time, when you talk about the stakes, remember about more than 70% of the Indian people are fed by these people. Just imagine. These farmers, they work day in and day out to make sure that there is enough produce to look after the needs of the Indian population. But this is what is happening to them. And this is not only one area. People are coming from Haryana, people are coming from Punjab, people are coming from Rajasthan. Now this is expanding. This is what exactly is going on. And the real picture of the so-called Indian democracy is this. You can see that on your screen. You can well imagine what's going on out there. These poor people are just asking for the simple right. They have been growing uh, various crops for centuries. The kind of support uh, these people should have had, that's unfortunately missing, except for a few statements coming from the people from the Congress. So today we'll be talking about these. Let me give you the major uh, points today in our uh, today's program. As it says, thousands of Indian farmers battled police across <coughs> New Delhi. Farmers are protesting against laws that deregulate the sale of crops. We'll be talking about this. The laws lay out the framework for private traders to purchase crops directly from the farmers and bypass the government marketing boards meant to ensure fair prices for the farmers. Agriculture uh, provides livelihood to nearly 70% of the country's 1.3 billion people and accounts for around 15% of the $2.7 trillion economy. Unrest among an estimated 150 million uh, land downing farmers is one of the biggest tests Modi has faced since coming to power in 2014. Furthermore, then 300,000 farmers have killed themselves since the 1990s. Just look at the number, 300,000. These people committed suicides. Nearly 10,300 did so in 2019 alone. Farmers and their workers are also abandoning agriculture in droves. 2,000 of them every day, according to the last census in 2011. Pretty interesting figures. Then, uh, from the late 2019, there were months of protests against the racist citizenship law, culminating in sectarian riots in Delhi in February 2020 that killed over 50 people. And last but not the least, says depicting the farmers as anti national, just imagine the anti national as happened with 2019 protesters backfired since they enjoy widespread support among Indians. Ignoring their demands also clashes with Modi's self-styled image as a champion of the poor. So these are the major points we'll be talking about in our today's show. Let me introduce you to our panelists. We have with us in our studio Sayyid Muhammad Ali. He's the Director of Strategic Affairs CASS. Thank you so much Ali Saab. Uh, for taking out your time in talking to PTV World. And uh, we have uh, two more guests on Skype. The first one is from United Kingdom. Man Magun Singh Saab. 
He is an assistant spokesperson of the Sikh Council in United Kingdom. Siddhar Saab, thank you so much for taking out your time and talking to PTV World, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have with us our next guest is from India, uh, Mandeep Singh Bajwa Saab. Bajwa Saab is a columnist, is a journalist, is a writer. Bajwa Saab, thank you so much for your time, sir, as well. Thank you for calling me, Jai Hind. Sajikalji, thank you so much. Now, if you allow me, sir, let's start off from our guest sitting in UK and then we'll be talking and having a word with the other guest. Now, sir, when, when we see, I mean, earlier before the start of the show, me and my friend Ali, uh, we were just having a word and I was just praising the Sikh community and the people and the kind of love I got when I visited in 2017. And I was telling him and that, you know, these people are so loving, so caring, so hardworking. And I think Sikh community is the pride of India. That is what I believe in. Whether you go to States or UK or, or even in India for that matter. The most, I think, uh, uh, special guest when you see a Sikh uh, in Pakistan is, is a Sardar. You know, this is what we believe in. This is how we feel about you. So obviously, this is primary reason to conduct this show. Now, so whatever is going on in India, we totally understand. We totally believe that this is an internal affair of India. But when we see these kind of visuals where the clashes are taking place and Sikh community is battered by the uh, Indian police, it seems that there isn't much difference in what is happening in Kashmir and what is happening outside Delhi now, sir. Your take, sir, that's up. I mean, the first uh, point you've raised is in, in regards to the Sikh community. I think we have a philosophy, as every culture does, and I think our philosophy of Sarbat Dabla. And I think that philosophy follows us wherever we go, whether in the UK, whether in India or in Pakistan or anywhere in the world. We have this idea that there needs to be well-being for everybody. Because if there's well-being for everybody, then everybody can succeed and have a successful life. Where there is not and a key equilibrium in that, you will get clashes and you will get disharmony within the community. And I think, like you've said, uh, in regards to the recent incidences and in regards to the whole agitation of the farmers, it's quite sad to see because, like you said, 70% of the Punjab region, Haryana region, has been the breadbasket of India for the last you know, 50, 60 years, even longer, even at the time of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. So Punjab has always been the breadbasket. And even though we are, I wasn't born there, but we have our heritage links, our religious links to that land. And we always feel that when anything happens in Punjab or in around India, we feel uh, affected by it because we're related to it through family, through heritage. So there can never be an Indian's internal matter because we will always be connected. So when people say this is just for India to deal with and is their internal issue, well, that's not true because Indians also live outside of India. And we also have a connection to India. So whatever happens in India affects us. And we have a right, we have a voice to raise against it if it's uh, causing disharmony or if it's causing any kind of issues to our people. Now, from outside, when we view the events which are going on in Delhi, especially yesterday, it's quite hurtful because we also want to celebrate in the Republic Day of India. The farmers have as much right as everybody else to celebrate within that uh, day. And when they had agreed roots, and this is the irony, they had agreed the roots with the Delhi administration. That these are the roots we're gonna take through the rally, and we want to be seen by the people, and we want to show our love for the Delhi people, and vice versa, receive their love through celebrating the day together. Now those agreed roots were first formulated, and then on the exact day when the parade was gonna take place, the police is then told to change those roots. Why? Because they want a reaction. They want a reaction from the farmers to show them to be anti-national. And that's the perfect timing, isn't it? On the Republic Day of India, they want to show the farmers and all the Punjabis to be anti-national. And that has always been their agenda because they want to make someone the scapegoat of all of this. They want to jeopardize the movement, which is a peaceful movement, is the biggest of its kind in the world. And they want to create some kind of commotion. And today, yesterday was their day to do it. And to be honest with you, I don't think they were successful. Yes, there were some clashes for which the police of Delhi and the Indian administration were responsible for. But on the larger scale of things, I think the farmers too came out on top. 
All right. Now, uh, coming to you, Mandeep Singh Bajwa sahab, normally mm -hmm. whenever we, we see, because normally, you know, protests take place almost everywhere. Even in Pakistan, you know, if there is an issue, at the end of the day, negotiation, talks, that's what is the name of the game. But over here, it seems that the Indian government is pretty reluctant and they are not ready to talk. And when you talk about the corporate culture, sir, farming is the oldest profession in the world, sir. And at the same time, when we talk about Haryana or Punjab, we always give examples of India that look at the government policies, the way they look after their farmers, and we compare that with Pakistan also. But unfortunately, what is happening now in India, we never thought this could actually be seen at some stage because the way the clashes are taking place and for a legitimate cause, these people are out having a peaceful protest, but the government seems to deny everything. Your take, uh, Janab Mandeep Singh Bajwa sahab. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it was nice listening to my uh, uh, friend from the UK. Uh, first, let me clear one thing. This is not a sick issue, per se. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a farmer's issue, and it's an issue of affecting all Indian farmers. And uh, the current agitation uh, has, of course, a large representation from um, uh, Punjab, but also from Har Haryana, also from Western UP, also from Rajasthan. And uh, uh, from all parts of India, uh, we've seen farmers coming from Tamil Nadu. Uh, there have been huge protests in uh, Maharashtra. Uh, farmers have marched from Nasik to Mumbai and uh -huh. held a huge uh, uh, demonstration, a uh, huge public meeting in the heart of uh, Bombay. And, uh, uh, you know, the support for, for the farmers is coming from across the board, uh, you know, from all sections of Indian society. Uh, having cleared that, uh, you know, uh, India is changing and, uh, you know, something has already changed. And uh, as you uh, pointed out, uh, you, you know, pointed towards the corporate culture. Uh, well, you know, they seem to have, and the big corporations seem to have inordinate uh, say, amount of say in the, this government's policy making. And uh, what farmers feel, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the, the propaganda against the farmers has been that they don't understand. They have not understand the reforms. I mean, how can you uh, say such a thing? I mean, the farmers are perfectly capable of understanding the issues affecting them. After all, it's a matter of life and death for them. So they have to understand the issues. And uh, the farmer today is much more aware uh, uh, than many sections of urban society. I mean, uh, uh, they've always been very aware. And now they're even more aware with all the uh, new uh, information, superhighway, uh, you know, reaching out uh, and reaching the villages. And uh, they un fully understand the issues. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the main objection which the farmers have uh, uh, to uh, the, uh, you know, three uh, new uh, black farm laws, as we call them, uh, are on two points. One is that uh, there is no guarantee given for uh, the minimum support price, which is the mainstay, the bedrock of agriculture, particularly in Punjab, Haryana, and Western UP, where uh, MSP is, uh, you know, it's an absolute thing. In other parts of India, some parts of India, you know, MSP is not even given. But here, it has always been given. It is a total bedrock of uh, Indian agriculture. And uh, this came out in the mid-60s when the government, in its push uh, towards uh, self-sufficiency in food, uh, brought in uh, new agriculture practices. They imported a large number of tractors. Uh, you know, they through the universities, they, uh, you know, the extension education um, uh, program of the agriculture universities, uh, they sought, sought to introduce new farming practices, new seeds, new crops, fertilizers, everything, you know, and they wanted farmers to invest in all these um, the new seeds, fertilizers, you know, tractors, agriculture machinery and uh, practices. So to provide them with a, uh, you know, with a mainstay, with a uh, safety net, the minimum support price came in. And in fact, it was... Uh, uh, the uh, Punjab government of that time, uh, which uh, started the government procurement of uh, food grains, and it's right. picked up by the central government, and it's become a system now. And uh, the second is, uh, you know, the uh, the agriculture uh, agriculture produced marketing committees where farmers go and uh, you know they uh, they're able to sell their produce. Uh, you know, most of it is procured by the government's agencies like the Food Corporation of India and some by, uh, you know, uh, private players. And uh, in this, in these three new, new laws, 
uh, both uh, these systems are, you know, uh, sought to be uh, not just downplayed, but abolished altogether. So, you know, farmers have a strong objection to that, and they feel that uh, this way they'll be at the mercy of corporations uh, who will um, dictate terms to them, and most of all, uh, they will not get the uh, the uh, minimum uh, price guaranteed to them currently. So th there's been a huge outcry over this, and farmers have been agitating uh, uh, since uh, September, or uh, you know probably before that. And the way the uh, farm laws were brought in is very unfair. I mean, uh, in the middle of a pandemic, the government promulgated uh, exactly. ordinances, exactly. and uh, then uh, uh, you know then they bulldozed the laws through. Uh, parliament uh, with uh, without any discussions, without saying, and then you know, then the government has made claims that we are consulted with the farmers, we are consulted with all stakeholders. Uh, uh, you know, uh, serial agitation, uh, sorry, applications put in under the Right to Information Act revealed that the government itself admitted that no uh, process of consultation had taken place. So you know, the government stand is uh, uh, you know very very tenuous, and uh, it's uh, something which uh, farmers have rightly objected to. And they have been forced to take up the path of agitation because, uh, you know, the government at first was reluctant to talk to them. When they found that, uh, you know, the they agitation is gathering steam, then they agreed very reluctantly. And even then, uh, uh, they have been uh, very obdurate, very rigid in their stand. And uh, the farmers also hardened their stand. And they, they, uh, they currently say that nothing less than total repeal will work. But at least at the minimum, the government will have to give written guarantees of uh, uh, minimum support price. Uh, I, I totally agree with you, Siddhasa, because at the end of the day, uh, what, what you said, it makes a lot of sense and they have a very legitimate concern also when you talk about the uh, farmers and you also mentioned that they are not only the sick farmers, they are all over. Uh, I mean, this protest is taking place in UP also. You, people have come from Tamil Nadu, people have come from Rajasthan and uh, I mean, it's going on because 70% of the people who are actually related to this agriculture side, I mean, they feel threatened. Economic no, prosperity the, is the I name found, of the game. I found uh, a lot of genuine support coming in from people in Pakistan. You know, um, genuine kind of support, not the... Because usual, sir, Pakistan uh, at the end of the day is also an agro-based country and we totally understand because the problems are very similar, similar as well. The kind of no, crops we grow are almost similar. The kind of language we speak is similar. So, you know, the concerns are similar as well. But Sayyid Mohammed Ali. Same plight. They feel that they have the same plight. All right. Sayyid Mohammed Ali Sahib, now, first of all, so that's a very categorically mentioned that, you know, there is a corporate culture, very influential, very, very influential people. And when you talk about the farmers, you know, the issue of the support price even exists in, in Pakistan as well. You know, the support price for wheat, support price for so and so crop. The problem is that uh, there has to be some sort of a guarantee. That's exactly uh, what Sardarsa was saying. And you know, when earlier, before the start of the program, what we were talking about was again this political economy. That is the name of the game. Yeah. So, your take on that, sir. Thank you. What could be a win win situation for both the parties? Uh, you rightly pointed out, as we were earlier discussing, that essentially it's a political economy issue. But it also um, explains and manifests in four very critical dimensions mm -hmm. in order to understand what's going on and how significant is this episode which we saw yesterday. I think that there are four aspects. There is a political aspect, there is an economic aspect, there is a social aspect, and there is a strategic aspect. The most important thing was when you see on the front pages of today's newspapers that um, the Lal Kila is having is not having the Indian national flag mm -hmm. but a flag of uh, which is reflective of the aspirations of some people mm -hmm. that is a huge signal for the world which has expectations from India uh, to rise as a uh, net security provider in this region and also as a critical pivot in the Indo-Pacific strategy. So that, I think, was noticed. Most interesting aspect uh, for our viewers would be that even the Indian, even the U.S. Embassy in India issued a warning that people should avoid going into those areas which are affected by it. Mm -hmm. So even the U.S. government has noticed with concern the politically unstable situation that we are witnessing in India. The second aspect is that obviously India wants to join 
uh, the UN Security Council. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a manifestation of the actual political, social and economic reality. The second aspect is political, which is very important. And that is? Because India is projecting itself for so many years as the world's largest democracy. Mm -hmm. But inspired by what my uh, Sikh friends just said, I think this protest, uh, which is countrywide and reflective of the aspirations and concerns of the majority of Indian farmers, which is not just a and legitimate and, and not just, uh, you know, it's not just about a food security issue. It mm -hmm. is a major employment issue. It's a bread and butter issue. So basically those who are sitting in the Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha are not representing the concerns and aspirations of the majority of Indians. So that is a huge issue in terms of the failure of Indian democracy as a political system. Because if it is a sound, mm -hmm. uh, successful system, then it should make laws and policies which are sensitive and reflective of the aspirations of the people. Correct. And obviously this would not be happening in uh, New Delhi if the policies and decisions were based on the aspirations and concerns of the farmers. So that is the political issue. The third is the political economy, which is the economic issue. It is very important that when you go towards corporate farming or when you move towards, uh, uh, you know, some sort of corporate industry based development of uh, mm -hmm. agricultural sector, the culture, the history, you know, agriculture is the oldest profession, a very successful profession, especially in this part of the world for so many, for centuries you are shaking the foundations of the society. Mm -hmm. So you can't take this decision overnight. So the process, as, and that was your question. But don't you think they, they the must process have done was some sort of homework as well, sir. And they should have the taken all the people, all the unions, all the farmer community on board. What do they want? So that the corporate interests or the industrialization of the agriculture sector and the interests of the vast majority of the farmers need to be balanced. Correct. But the last point I think will be the most interesting is the strategic aspect that while. India, especially the Modi Sarkar, wanted to present to the world on 26th uh, January its might and its show of force in terms of the military parade, showcasing the Rafale aircraft, the T-90 tanks, but the world attention was not looking at, America, at the Indian power, but they were looking at what's ho happening uh, on the streets of Delhi in terms of the riots and, and the manifestation and expression of the grievances of the farmers. That is the actual reality of India, which now I think the international community is recognizing and rising up. And I'm, I'm sure, uh, Ali, uh, when you talk about the human rights, I mean, this is purely human rights violations. I mean, one poor guy died just because his tractor overturned and he, he was dead there and then. And then the clashes taking place. I mean, Sikhs were always regarded and they are still remembered as, as a very strong, uh, I would say, nation, a group of people, very patriotic. But, you know, when it comes to the uh, legitimate side of it, I mean, they will never back out. One thing is for sure. Because, you know, and, when and they are saying they have, they have expressed, the farmer unions have said that they can stay in for, the, one, year. for one year in yes. New Delhi. Yes. So this is not going to go away. So, so they so, have turned New Delhi into another Kashmir. You know, that's, I, 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 would, I would blame the Indian government for that because, you know, they should have taken this decision. These people, if they are out and so committed, there has to be some sort of a logic attached to it. Now, going back to uh, our friend in, 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 in UK, now, uh, Man Magun Singh Sahib, if there is a proper way forward, or if I may ask you that what should be the right approach from both these sides, what would you say? I mean, the first thing I want to pick up is on the subsidy um, aspect. You know, even in the UK, farmers are paid subsidies. Even in these countries, there is a system uh, which is introduced to support the farmers. Yep. So it's not something which is unique just to everyone in the world, but it's, it's, a, it's a recognized uh, fact of, of, of the world that farmers do need that support, that if they are producing these products, they need to be taken. I mean, look, there are, there are two, two ways which we, which we see in the UK. Even here, I will remember, there were several laws which were passed which went against the farming and even, for example, fox hunting. There was a big issue around that. And the government here 
did then review those laws and did retract them as well. There's no shame in admitting when you're wrong, you are wrong. But I think there is this kind of attitude in the Indian administration that they would not take or they would not reverse what they have put forward. So we think the first thing to do is that they need to understand that the farmer's position, until you are, like, like I think Mr. Elidji said, this is their bread and butter. If their bread and butter is gone, then what do they have left? And I think until the Indian administration understands that, they would not understand the concerns of the farmers. Because these farmers are the ones who own the two acres, the five acres. Some of them may own the 100 or 200 acres. But what are they compared to 10,000 acres of a corporation? They're finished. So they have to understand that these farmers and the whole of their produce is reliant upon these subsidies, which are worldwide. So the solution would be first and foremost is not to suspend them, but to say to the farmers, OK, we want to go forward with you. So let's sit down and let's reinvent something which can be agreeable to both sides. First, reinvent what could be applicable and acceptable to both sides. Once you've invented that, then you can obviously put them forward, get the support of your people and retract these laws. These laws will have to be taken back because the way the situation is now, that the farmers have made their stand. And this is their final stand. The farmers are not going to go back on false promises and then come back another two, three years or another year later, because they're saying, aren't they, that the high courts have said for two years we will suspend these laws. After two years, will the farmers be doing the same thing again? I mean, th this is no joke for them. So the way they see it, they are here now and they are not going to go back until their demands are met. And I think the way forward is that the government had to admit they made a mistake. It was a joke. I mean, I saw how the Lok Sabha passed these laws. It was an absolute joke of democratic process. They went against their own democratic process in their own Lok Sabha. Their own MPs were MLAs or whatever the correct terminology is for, for the Indian uh, members of parliament. They themselves objected to the way this law was passed and they just forced it through. So the whole process was a joke. It wasn't democratic. So from the day one, how can you then say this is a law which will benefit your farmers, which has not even followed your democratic process correctly? Listen to your farmers, like when the Singh said. They are All not right. illiterate. They are fully illiterate. They're fully aware of what's being uh, implemented and they should be listened to and they should be consulted in any future uh, such laws. But these laws need to be removed at all cost. So primarily, you know, <clears throat> it's more about um, having a proper negotiation and then a proper commitment coming from the government for the support of the uh, farmers. But again, I mean, what if they say it and they don't do it? Because I've, 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 been, I've been reading and, you know, there were protests taking place in 2019. And look at the number of farmers. I mean, this is the first time, in fact, we are doing a show on this issue. The highest suicide rate, as far as the farmers are concerned, that is in India. And let me put this question uh, to Mandeep Singh Bajwa Saab, that what I mean, now this is about a certain law the government wants in place and the protesters or the farmers, they have a very, very deep concern and a legitimate, legitimate right uh, to, to oppose it. But sir, also let's throw light on the previous issues and interestingly look at the number of people who committed suicide, sir. Why was that so? Bajwa sir? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I fear I must start with, again with the, with the uh, correction. Uh, the Indian tricara flying on top of the Red Fort uh, was not replaced or desecrated in any way and still right. flies proudly over there. And that okay. is a bit of a, a disinformation which uh, I know has taken a lot of people in. Uh, the uh, farmers planted, a, uh, they, they hoisted a Sikh religious flag and, uh, you know, later on uh, they took it down. Well, and in any case, that incident is over now, whatever. All right. Uh, regarding, you know, uh, it's a very sad fact, uh, the farmer suicides. You know, uh, over the years, over the decades, fragmentation of land holdings has led to, you know, uh, most farmers uh, tilling very small pieces of land, which are really not uh, uh, sustainable. I mean, uh, farming on those uh, small, the small bits of uh, land is not really, you know, they can't even... Um, you know, 
use proper machinery and you know sometimes they've got to uh, you know i've been i've been a, a village council leader myself for a uh, longish period and uh, you know also worked with other uh, agriculture and cooperative and uh, you know financial institutions in the rural areas so you know uh, we try to provide farmers with the, the best agriculture machinery and all but it still is not enough and uh, you know the farmers are very independent also they like to uh, own their own machinery their own tractors you have everything you know uh, self sustaining uh, but uh, you know fragmentation has uh, deprived them of the benefits of uh, modern technology and uh, on top of it you know the debts the crop loans other the things then you know conspicuous consumption the growing consumerism and uh, has resulted in uh, a lot of indebtedness and uh, that is something we noticed by the british also you remember the sir malcolm darling's excellent book at the turn of uh, in the last century the punjab peasant in uh, prosperity and debt uh, which is still a classic i mean still very relevant now right now but uh, uh, what i'm coming to is that you know this weight of this indebtedness has forced many farmers in their despair uh, to uh, you know take their own lives it is a very sad thing and you know uh, the uh, government uh, has tried to help but you know they can't do enough and also you know they would certainly not like to um, uh, you know uh, promote uh, the taking of people uh, promote this thing of fact of people taking their own lives so you know they sort of uh, try tend to downplay it and uh, sometimes there have been uh, you know uh, uh, instances where you know governments have uh, uh, written off debts and all but uh, uh, still not enough i think the whole new look has to be taken in agriculture but it cannot be uh, done at the, at the in the in the way that it's been thought to be done now by the growing co- corporatization because you know the farmer is very independent uh, he doesn't like to be uh, beholden to anybody and uh-huh. uh, you know he would like to till his own land i mean uh, uh, every man every farmer is an emperor in his own right so you know the, these are sort of things which uh, uh, you know the current dispensation the political bureaucratic dispensation in delhi doesn't understand and uh, their growing dependence on the corporates for uh, electoral funding uh, hmm. has placed in a position where uh, you know they've got to deliver on uh, 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 some promises uh, um, in the beginning of uh, the, uh, this, the the this uh, ruling party's last term uh, they brought in this land acquisition bill which again was uh, very slanted in favor of corporates and um, uh, um, didn't do very much to favor the farmers but there was strong opposition in parliament and you know uh, the uh, leader of the uh, largest opposition party the congress mr rahul gandhi made this famous remark calling uh, the current uh, the uh, government uh, the a suit boot ki sarkar uh, which really cut them to the quick and you know they were uh, quick to you know uh, 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 abandon abandon the, uh, the the land acquisition law and after that again corporates have been wanted their pound of flesh so uh, they are now collecting and uh, with so many elections crucial elections coming up and with the ruling parties uh, attempt to win over the whole country even uh, in punjab uh, even in jammu and kashmir so mm-hmm. uh, their dependence on corporates is growing day by but, day but bajwa sir another point i mean uh, you know uh, in 2014 when modi government uh, took charge i mean the overall concept was that uh, he was supported largely by the corporate uh, side and he made a lot of promises and he wanted to convert the entire india Uh, into you know somewhat like a gujarat model and then even in the second election when you look at the support he got from the corporate culture obviously so you know if you're getting um, some sort of a monetary uh, support from that side or otherwise you're bound to take certain decisions that would favor them financially obviously that is the name of the game so do you believe that at some stage i mean there could be you know a balance an equilibrium where the corporate culture would step back a little the protesters would be you know uh, would be taken care of and their wishes i'm not saying 100% what they are demanding would be would be taken into into account but at least to 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 some level where they are they are satisfied 
do you see that happening in the in the coming days or you believe that this protest or the strength it has it is going to gain further momentum bajwa sahab well you know uh, the, as i said the corporates are now to get their pound of flesh i mean uh, uh, with the amount of money that uh, they invested in this government and its uh, electoral mm. machine they want some return so uh, this is one way that uh, i mean they they have these large corporations have always wanted to get into the retail trade in food uh, which is something i mean uh, it doesn't require much marketing i mean people have got to have food i mean if you control the retail trade i mean look at the amount of uh, money that uh, you will make and uh, you know and then through a process of uh, you know uh, 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 you know uh, storage and uh, value addition and all and uh, mm. uh, packaging you uh, present this to the, to the uh, consumers and uh, i mean you really clear but then uh, on then, then they go to procure uh the uh, the grains at uh, low prices which is where uh, msp comes in so they can't really have this msp there they um, but then the farmer can't be left at the mercy of market forces and this Correct. is not something uh, unique to india it's a universal phenomenon i mean uh, the usa pays uh, uh, farmers 10 times more subsidies uh, than the indian government gives it i mean they, that, they have correct. to subsidize farming they have to subsidize farming otherwise Uh, your food security will go for a six. I mean, um, if, if 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 farmers are deprived of subsidy, they are deprived of um, an assured income, if they are deprived of financial security, and they will abandon farming and take up jobs. And uh, 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 then who is going to be left to grow grow food? I mean, absolutely, uh, absolutely. There is something which everybody understands. I mean, hmm. farmers in USA are uh, sometimes paid to. Uh, leave their uh, uh, fields empty not grow crops so it's exactly no to maintain the prices i i totally understand yes sir prices that is the way prices don't crash no mm. we've seen it here uh, prices of potatoes sometimes can really crash when when there's a glut i mean the uh, remember the uh, um, these uh, see uh, plated potatoes you know 78 79 when i mean um, uh, the prices totally crashed and uh, you know i mean um, the potato farmers were out on the streets So that exactly, and same thing happened in United States of America also. I remember they were like uh, they had so much of produce, but they were not Correct. allowed to sell it. So they were just distributing it to the poor people out there, and people used to come and travel for about one hundred miles to get it. Can you imagine? Now, very interesting, Correct. very very interesting analysis, Bajwa sir. So your take. Let's uh, take very, the same point. Uh, very very quickly, I think. Let me add. I mean, my first book um, was on Indian nuclear program, and let me share with your um, viewers today mm -hmm. that the India, um, as per their own official documents, acquired the ability to test nuclear weapons in the 60s. Mm -hmm. But they decided the political decision not to conduct a test was largely based on the food security considerations because at that time India was also a recipient of uh, U.S. food program okay. and they thought that uh, the us sanctions will destabilize the government and the government will go so they did not test their nuclear weapon till the time they uh, achieved that confidence that the us sanctions will not affect so food and the kind security of subsidies exactly. which were given to those farmers in india yeah. were unbelievable like so, so the economy and politics and the food security are critical issues hmm. and i think hmm. this event is not an um, episode in isolation okay. it needs to be seen in the political economic strategic uh, implications mm -hmm. it is very important because what is simmering it is a reflection of the reality mm. that the modi sarkar has neglected and tried to sweep under the carpet it is very important for the observers But the million dollar question is that sir uh, is modi going to ditch the corporate uh, uh, support or uh, you know obviously if you if they are investing it happens everywhere in the world if they are investing they want the return also so it is stage. very important for the world to realize that this uh, you know facade of uh, hindutva hmm. is, is sponsored by the corporate Uh, uh india and also a bit of diaspora as well mm -hmm. but underneath it lacks the strong roots of the political system it lacks the support mm -hmm. of the majority of the people it lacks the support and consideration uh of the farmers and i think the indian political economy will not be able to absorb this shock and i think this will gain momentum in future 
and weaken and seriously damage uh, the current uh, government because the corporate uh, sector has funded the Hindutva project, but it lacks the economic and political support and wider appeal within the uh, farmer community, mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, committing suicides in thousands of numbers in the last 30 years. So what else do you need? I don't think uh, uh, Indian reality can be better understood uh, from any event than this particular one. And, and, and I understand uh, uh, the sensitivity of Bajwasa, but uh, I think uh, if anybody has to see the headlines uh, in today's newspapers, mm -hmm. even today's dawn front page mm -hmm. picture is that, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, an independent Khalistan movement flag was raised. And uh, it is something, although temporarily, Maybe that could but not be the, uh, the the aim of the majority. Yes, but you know, in such a chaos, yes. anything can happen. Absolutely, and people, and, would, and people hmm. will. And the, um, I, I, as a political analyst, uh, feel that such irresponsible policies by the uh, by the BJP government mm -hmm. can accelerate and escalate the independence movements in different parts of India which and and the economic aspect will further uh, reinforce their drive and aspiration for independence it will weaken india politically socially and economically because you know when we when we talk about uh, uh, we are not doing a propaganda or anything because Absolutely. we have got guests from india and from yes. uk and they are giving their own uh, opinion about it but interestingly you talk about CNN, you talk about BBC, you talk Absolutely. about any international top channel. The German they channel. are covering this Absolutely. story. Uh, I mean, they're taking it as a, as a headline. And, and the U.S. Embassy in Delhi is issuing a warning that mm -hmm. please, for, for the U.S. citizen, don't visit there. Mm -hmm. So you think if the U.S. citizens are advised against visiting those areas of New Delhi, do you think foreign investors are going to come and add India and help them, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, develop economically and strategically? I think the international community is beginning to understand Indian reality better now. Mm -hmm. But let's see, I mean, there's another last quick comment uh, from you regarding uh, the, the future course of action. You believe that the Modi government is going to sit with these protesters or, or their uh, leaders for that matter and come out with some sort of a viable solution or this protest is going to go on actually for, for some more time. Actually, the and it could get uh, deadly as actually, well. Actually, dilemma is because mm. Modi uh, Sarkar and I think uh, our friends from India uh, aptly pointed out because they have been funded by the corporate sector, they so they are out. they are uh, so their commitment towards the corporate financier is too much. On the other hand, the grievance of the people is also significant and it is growing. The grievance of the people, Absolutely. I think, to me is more important. Yes. That should be addressed on ASAP basis. Because the test of the, essentially, the test of the political system and success is, does it reflect and represent the will of the people or not? And the current dispensation does not seem even sensitive, let alone representative Sir, of their there concern. was this... Uh, young Sikh, uh, uh, his name was Naresh Singh and uh, you know somebody was interviewing him and you know and he said we'll look at our commitment. He, this was the person who said that we can stay here for one year and he just drove his tractor into the cloud of uh, that tear gas. What I'm saying is this is the level of commitment yes. and as far as Sikhs are concerned I, I'm not sure about the rest and of they're the a very proud Indian. community you know? sir very Absolutely. proud committed uh, yes. very proud very committed yes. very patriotic yes and good people they are no nonsense they will not no take this at all uh, they will not a, take this from BJP. exactly and I yes. don't think they will back up but there, there has to be a proper uh, course of action there should be proper negotiations and yes we do understand that the corporate culture has a lot of influence but I think the people of India uh, matter more these farmers matter more, food security, water security. This is a part of the national security. Because if BJP doesn't uh, reflect and s listen to their grievances, they will let nobody down except their own nation. All right, sir. Anyway, Ali, thank you so much, sir. Thank it was you. a pleasure uh, having you in the show. And I would also thank our friends uh, from uh, UK, Man Magan Singh Saab. Thank you so much, sir, for your participation. And Mandeep Singh Bajwa, it was a pleasure having you, sir. We will keep on, in fact, uh, having you in our uh, shows as well in the future. But it was a pleasure talking to you. And let's hope that the issues are sorted out soon, sir. And the farmers are given, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> a free hand to, to, to farm and to produce and to look after the affairs of India. 
was lovely talking to you, sir. Thank you so much. And that's all we have um, you know, for this. Uh, I'll see you, inshallah, tomorrow at 8. Till then, you take good care. Khuda Hafiz.